Ladies and gentlemen, dear guests, dear friends, Stefania, Anton, Katerina, welcome to what is one of the most important moments of our association, the presidential address. As Secretary General, there are very few perks. I get asked all sorts of things and I have all sorts of complaints. But one of the best perks is to introduce this, this event. And it's particularly touching this year because you've just seen Leonardo, you've got Ruggiero, we got I didn't want you to think this is an Italian affair. <laughs> Ruggiero, you've chosen uh, another friend to introduce you, Professor Gino Gerosa from Padua. I do hope that your friendship will endure after his presentation. Finally, life goes the direction of time. I think the time has come for you to deliver your presidential address very soon, but not before Gino's introduction. Gino, may I please invite you? Good morning, dear colleagues. Thank you, Domenico. I'm not apologizing yet with Ruggiero. So, they actually asked me to talk in seven, to introduce in seven minutes the life and achievement of Ruggiero de Paulis. Difficult task, I have to say. However, it's more than a pleasure, it's a privilege to introduce Ruggiero and his presidential address. I could actually start and finish with this slide, because this is one of the biggest achievements of Ruggiero. It's worldwide well known because of the Valsalva prosthesis. It's part of his genius. So this is a little cute Ruggiero at the seaside. He's sitting on a bench and he's thinking. What do you think he's thinking? He's thinking about a sun castle? He's thinking about running on the beach? No, wrong. He was already thinking about the Valsalva prosthesis. As I said, he was a cute, very well educated little boy, but then he was swinging from a joker personality to a Bond personality. My name is Bond, Ruggiero Bond. But finally he graduated in medicine and he decided to become a cardiac surgeon. Here is a very young researcher awarded when he was working at the University of Utah in Salt Lake City and presenting a, a study on total artificial heart. Every one of us knows that uh, when you're doing research, you have an exceptional moment when you are very excited about the results, but sometimes you are a little bit disappointed about the result. And the same happened to Ruggiero. And he was a little bit depressed at that time. So he was absolutely fond of sport, team sport like rugby, like basketball, or solo sport like surfing. But he really loved cycling. Cycling with Stefania, his wife. We all know that behind a big man there is a big woman. And Stefania has been fundamental to keep him on track. If you remember those slides before, you know about the Joker personality, the Bond personality. So I think we have to thank Stefania to keep him on track. And not only Stefania, but the world, the Paulist family that is here. So Ruggiero, a tale of friendship, love for nature, and the Italian gang that has been already mentioned by Domenico, our general secretary. So here is Ruggiero with some Italian friends. I don't need to tell you that they just borrowed the fish at the fish market in Tampa because they were totally unable <laughs> doing fishing. And this is even more spectacular picture. A lot of guys are in this, in this room sitting there and they will hardly recognize themselves. They were pretty young. Love for nature. I'm a little bit embarrassed about this picture. Ruggiero, what's going on here? I have to pay a tribute and I have to apologize with the deer. <laughs> but this is an exceptional moment for cardiac surgery because we are moving from standard cardiac surgery to minimal invasive to microinvasive cardiac surgery. That means the ability to repair structural artifacts of the heart by using transcatheter technologies. So, there are no boundaries because cardiac surgeons have the power to dream. 
and of course, Ruggiero de Paulis has the power to let us dream. So it's my pleasure to call Ruggiero to the podium and please don't stop him. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> Thank you, Gino, for your kind word and your sincere friendship. Dear colleague, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure and an honor to serve you as a president of the association for the past year. In moments like this, I have a duty to thank all of those who, in different ways, have worked closely with me and have contributed directly or indirectly to this achievement. First of all, I must thank all our past president, who, along with the Council, not only chose me as a president, but have been there for a constant support through the year. Together, we have shared in a vision of strategic choices, member initiative, and a new generation of educational opportunities. I would like also to express sincere thanks to Peter Captain and Domenico Pagano, the two Secretary General who have served on the board of directors during the last years. They both have taken on an enormous amount of work in the management and organization of the association. I completed my residency in Turin, where my professional life truly began. I am extremely grateful to my mentor, Professor Mario Morea, who has been like a father to me, constantly stimulating me with new projects. Together, we started a program of standardless vault that contributed significantly to my knowledge of the Arctic route. During those years, my passion for research and investigation was shared deeply with Dr. Jimmy Otinio, a brilliant man and a fine surgeon who opened my eyes to the world of scientific publication and methodological rigor. Tragically, an ill-fated accident prevented him from crowning a career that promised to be brilliant and he deserved to be remembered. Reflecting on my time at the University of Utah, I must thank the gigantic personality that is Willem Kolff. Perhaps some of you won't be aware, but Dr. Kolff is the father of renal dialysis, intraortic balloon pump, artificial heart, and many other achievements that are stamped in the history of modern medicine. <clears throat> he was always pushing us to think outside the box. He, his legacy, are impossible to forget. From my experience in France, I want to thank my friend, Philippe Deleuze, who invited me to France in the first place, with whom I shared my first real experience of cardiac surgery, and Gerard Bloch, a past president of the French society, who gave me the opportunity to accumulate a great caseload in the early stage of my career. For my time in Italy, at the University of Rome, Tor Vergata, I want to thank my former chief, Professor Luigi Chiariello, with whom I shared the beginning of my clinical and scientific activity in Italy. From him, I learned the value of hard work and perseverance in spite of difficulty that one can face. Together, we started an academic project at Rome European Hospital that will later become my home. On that note, I extend a special thank to all of my colleagues at the European Hospital they are my family, and it's because of them I'm here in front of you today. Thank you, guys. <clears throat> Only with time, we understand and appreciate the wisdom and intelligence of our parents. <clears throat> Even with such a large family, in fact, I'm the first of six children, my parents have always supported me in my studies, and my mother has always been the driving force of our family. Unfortunately, my father died prematurely at the age of 62 due to an aortic dissection. That such circumstances during the last year of my residency clearly indicated what would become the greatest interest in my profession. He has always continued to be an important source of inspiration through my life. <clears throat> I just wish you could see this. My wife, 
Stefania, <clears throat> is certainly the companion of a lifetime. She has been strong and supportive in difficult moments and always full of spirit and fun in everyday life. She has constantly reminded me that work is only one aspect of my life. I couldn't wish anything more. Thank you, Stefania. <clears throat> Together, we have adopted four wonderful children who have enriched us in a way I could never have imagined. <clears throat> Sorry for the emotion. They are certainly the best achievement of my life. I hope to be able to support them in the best way in the future. Finally, I want to thank my niece, Alessia, for her help in finalizing this presentation that now began. When I started thinking about this presidential address, I knew it would not be easy for a number of reasons. First, stepping outside of my native language might prevent me from broader and complete expression. And second, my message would have to reach colleagues spanning an age range for resident in training to establish surgeon. Finally, and by no means a trivial matter, it would have to summon up the ability to address a group of people when body cultures, habits, lifestyle and organization ability, they are often completely different. In this regard, and just to break the ice, I turn your attention to a short video that highlights the differences found in the European community. I immediately apologize to my Italian colleague for using these stereotypes, but in the spirit of gallantry, I certainly cannot lampoon habits of customs or colleagues from other European countries. However, it illustrates that be behind a pleasant bit of satire, we have different habits when we drive, order a coffee, or park our car. The passion for our work binds us together and makes it possible for an association like this to continually grow flourish and be cemented by this diversity, a diversity that resides in our culture and in our stories and in how we observe and solve problems. Different environment and different professional formation are our strength, not our weakness, and underpin our ability to innovate and improve. Today, we are a great association, made up of a group of people who have a lot in common, much more than it seemed at the first sight. Even in an era of increasing inequality, we can all still share the importance of health systems that offer free access to all citizens, giving them the right to the best available treatment. We have a group of surgeons selected on the basis of a certain key characteristic. First, we have the ability to endure a long and demanding course of training. Second, we can tolerate long and heavy hours of work. And we can also endure bitter defeats, less than enough that touch us deeply and yet give us the ability to analyze, metabolize, and overcome failures to regain our spirit and strength the very next day. Furthermore, and very importantly, we have the ability to tread the thin line between the life of the patient and our ability to complete our task. This is certainly a great heritage left us by the pioneers of this profession in times when the ideas only become innovations after those involved were prepared to take risk and experiment on the patient, all the while during an era where the ethics of our profession were still being actively shaped according to personal perspective and belief. In the last 50 years, we have succeeded in moving from the first open heart operation to the cross circulation, to cardiac transplantation, 
to the optimal repair of heart valve to the artificial heart, all the way to the achievement of low mortality rate and the transformation of cumbersome operation into minimally invasive procedure. In the short term of a generation, we are now able to avoid entering the chest and stopping the heart, and we can start to treat it from outside. It is not hard to imagine the medicine is destined to journey from manual approaches to an increasingly more automated world, one where transcatheter procedure will be carried out via artificial intelligence. In celebration of the extraordinary achievement of the human mind, it is fitting to this year to be honoring Leonardo da Vinci, who, for most of us, represents the sense of human genius. But who's going to carry the next revolution in medicine? As with many fields, perhaps the sea change in medicine will come from outsiders. Walmart did not transform the retail trade, Amazon did. General Motors and Volkswagen have not revolutionized the future of the car industry. Its pioneers were Waymo and Tesla. And national TV stations have not changed the world of the media. Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube have done it. There are many considerations that may benefit the future of cardiac surgery. But what is certain is that if we want to maintain our leadership, we have to be a reference for the next generation. We must follow the ethics that always guided us every time a technological achievement becomes available. What's more, we must also ensure we adhere to the correct evaluation, objective interpretation of evidence. How many times did the pioneers and founders of our profession experiment with new tools? What were the ethics that guided them? What is the right state of mind to adopt when testing a new instrument or ideas? I will now show you a very short clip taken from a successful TV series depicting the days when surgery began to have a more scientific and pragmatic approach. Maybe it will serve as a basis for some reflection on our profession, the innovation within it, and the problems they are intimately related. It is an extreme example, but in their quest for innovation, the pioneers in this clip clearly suffered greatly from their cause. What for the lesson may we draw from this bit of historical theater that may apply to modern day surgery? First is the respect and the role that the medical profession has had over time, gradually changing in relation to society. Second is the disruptive role of innovation that has way characterized the modern surgeon. And a final lesson lies in the ethic of surgery, that while pervading all aspects of our profession, play an even more important role in the context of innovation. The word profession deserves a special consideration in itself. It derives from the Latin profitery, which means to declare openly, and denotes not only a good job or an occupation, but also a group of people who do the same job. Nevertheless, when applied to medicine, profession assumes an intrinsic and implicit meaning of vocation. It is precisely for this reason that the medical profession has always been given a role of complete autonomy. Through professional association, society was convinced that science-based medicine was superior to all other alternatives, and therefore it was necessary to rely on it without reservation. 
Having received this recognition from society, the medical professional was also granted the freedom to regulate itself by establishing its own rules for education and training, as well as those for obligation and discipline. All of this was greatly amplified by the belief that only those who understood medicine could make a proper judgment, especially in the face of scientific and technological advances. From an ethical point of view, it was a period of paternalism, where the patient was not considered competent enough to understand or participate in the medical decision that lay ahead. Then again, patient did not question the work of the doctor either. For many years, ethical ideology has been firmly rooted in good intention. Anything could probably be done in the good faith to help the patient. In our profession, just think of the first extracorporeal circulation or to the cross circulation. Over the years, improvement of knowledge and increased general awareness have seen paternalism replaced with patient autonomy and the sharing of therapeutic choices. Ethics, in a general sense, has an independent and self-sufficient value, belong to subject, not to a profession. However, the ethic of the surgeon, and even more the cardiac surgeon, differ from other medical professionals. Surgeons face immediate palpable evidence of whether the right path has been followed. There is no room to ponder possible consideration or for personal interpretation. When situations are complex, when the patient condition is severe, or when the risk of surgery is high, the special relationship between surgeon and patient is never more important. Patients are completely relying on their surgeon. Thus, are best comforted when the surgeon's capacity, trustworthiness, and integrity are clear to see. The weight of this duty and the desire for a flawless performance place a great deal of emphasis on our ethical approach. But we cannot consider ourselves ethical just because we act with good intention. Ethics must be intertwined with our professional and human responsibility. Unfortunately, over the years, the medical profession has been accused of having somehow abuse of these privileges. Following the push for greater openness and transparency, the principle of self-management and self-regulation within the profession have been progressively criticized and gradually dictated by bodies often external to the medical world. This year, the Pulitzer Prize winning in the National Consortium of Investigative Journalists has proposed a worldwide investigation into thousands of cases of deaths and personal injuries related to medical devices, developing the first global database of medical devices and their issue accessible to all. In this kind of circumstances, our association has an opportunity to remodel dialogue with the society, to step outside the operating room and invest in a clear, honest and bright relationship. In the house of glass, where we are all called to enter, there is no room for omissions or secrets. We should always be able to dictate ethical rules as well as control and manage them demonstrate that our professional skills are maintained and updated over the years, exclude those who demonstrate non-competent or unethical behavior, and show that we take conflict of interest seriously. Ultimately, we should ensure that the professional integrity remain our core strengths in order to secure the trust of both citizen and patient. Innovation has an increasingly important role in our lives. Pier Paolo Pasolini was an Italian intellectual and a great thinker. He has defined innovation as an improvement of an existing condition, while progress is rooted in the well-being of a population. We can apply the same concept to cardiothoracic surgery. Innovation shows us what is new, but cannot always indicate what is best. Only when innovation passes the test of time and affirms itself as a cure, a technique or as a standard product, we can talk about real progress. The more groundbreaking or disrupting the technology, the faster the process. Smartphone or TAVI are two similar examples in different fields. Innovation 
is the main way in which cardiac surgery has always advanced. Dr. Mark Allen, in his presidential address, defined innovation as a change that has an impact. However, innovation is not always successful. Think of the use of laser in ischemic heart disease or the advent of standardless prosthesis for aortic valve replacement. Therefore, it is perhaps more accurate to say that this innovation is a change with the potential to have an impact. Innovation is an irreprehensible desire of the human condition. It has a core role in the continuous progress of cardiac surgery. After all, the first surgeons were barbers. Thus, ever since, it has been imperative to refine our tools alongside our skills in order to ensure greatness. Innovation often derives from a careful and constant observation of the world around us. This was definitely true of Leonardo da Vinci, whose genius, like pioneers of surgery, relied on the ability to ask a question, observe things in a systematic and even obsessive way, absorb ideas from outside the discipline, and verify and experiment with ideas. Innovation in surgery is constant and multifaceted. Often, advances are true almost imperceptible changes in the step of a well-known surgical procedure, whereas other times it happens through the experimental or new tools or devices. Certainly, our future will be increasingly technological. In any case, the development and the use of new technologies always pose numerous ethical dilemma that preface the third aspect of my presentation. Whenever we have an idea or develop a new project, sooner or later we are faced with ethics. Ethics remind us the line between an idea and innovation. There is a patient on whom that idea or solution must be tested. I also faced a similar situation approximately 20 years ago. I had recently created a new graft for aortic root surgery that, although it could be used in any type of aortic operation, was mainly designed to optimize valve implantation, as described by Tyrone David. After having obtained the CE mark and having performed the first clinical test with Bendel and remodeling intervention, I find myself one evening in front of a young Marfan patient with an acute dissection. Two of the three sinus were dissected and the valve was pristine. It was a tempting opportunity to show that this was the right setting where the advantages of an anatomical reconstruction were well suited both for the age and the pathology of the patient. Unfortunately, however, both direct experience with technique of reimplantation and the use of the new graph in these specific circumstances were minimal or absent. Yes, the surgical steps were all clear and designed in my mind, but I lack the confidence that is typical in everyday practice. I can vividly remember the long time I remained silent and motionless, thinking about whether to go ahead in the direction of what I perceived as a personal but potentially more risky scientific interest, or to follow the traditional path that seemed safer for the patient, but that would have involved the replacement of the valve with a mechanical prosthesis. In the end, and not without a great internal torment, I overcame my fears and followed the instinct they told me that if there were no problem, it would be the most favorable choice for the patient also. I'm delighted to say that things went well, and even today, 19 years later, the valve continues to work well, and the patient leads a perfectly normal life. Every day, we make choices in our surgical practice, and we must carry the weight and the responsibility for it. However, when we do while trying something new or innovative, the ethical problem takes on a different value. The rules of ethics tell us that the primary interest, which is the patient's well-being, must never be challenged by the secondary interest. However, in innovation, a secondary interest is always present. It is essential for those who have generated or contributed to developing that new technique or that new device. The close relationship between doctors and engineers is a part and parcel of our success. John Gibbon and the founder of IBM, Tom Watson, paved the way to the first heart-lung machine. 
The relationship between Dr. Albert Starr and engineer Lowell Edwards led to the Starr Edwards ball valve, and Dr. Viking Bjork and Donald Shiley collaborated to realize the Bjork Shiley single disc valve, among many others. The dream of a biological prosthesis by Alain Carpentier, stop the slide, has become reality with the Carpentier Edwards valve. And the idea of Ottavio Alfieri of a double orifice mitral valve, you are one slide behind, led to development of the mitral clip. How can we not mention the fundamental contribution of industry in the pioneer type technology that began with the idea of Alain Cribier and Jacques Seguin? Not all ideas and collaboration have been successful, but industry has always harnessed the power of doctors in order to optimally disseminate their technology. It is an ongoing relationship that benefits from and is nourished by mutual competences. Nevertheless, industry needs to generate business. And at some stage, this is how the good relationship between doctors and industry was somehow infiltrated by suspicion. If it is perceived that there are intentions existing behind the primary interest of the patient, society loses confidence in medicine, and the result is constant pressure to control the economic relationship between doctor and company from the outside. But the reverse is also true. Too strict a regulation of this relationship can interrupt vital collaboration. They are based on solid ethical ground. What is the solution? Once again, it is a so-called house of glass. Relationship between industry and medicine should be transparent, free to enter, and with no shady corners. Finances are usually tied in the academic world, but the emergence of industry has meant that the medical world has been increasingly able to produce scientific research, influence choices and strategies, and therefore address professional guidelines. However, it is true that industry rarely sponsors research in which there are no drugs, products, or devices that are directly produced by them. This aspect underlies the need for other sources of financing in order to conduct clinical trials that can answer important clinical questions or that can evaluate a device in the most independent possible way. In this context, our association could play a supporting guiding role in the future. Another issue we are all aware of is that sponsored studies often tend to have a favorable result for the drug or the sponsored device in question. This table shows how sponsored trials tend to report positive results for those who design the study. This usually appears to be independent of the quality and methodology used. In fact, sponsored trials often have a high methodological standard, valid randomization center, as well as high quality and frequent auditing process. So, is there is actually bias? Could it be possible that the way the trial is designed even the inclusion-exclusion criteria can somehow be constructed in a way that ensure a high probability of the desired outcome. Take this lie-hurted example. This is a prospective randomized trial aimed at verifying whether the use of a parachute when jumping off an airplane can reduce mortality and serious injury compared to not using a parachute. Out of 92 selected individuals, 64 refused randomization. <laughs> Five were excluded, but 23 were randomized to the use of a parachute or an empty backpack. No difference was found in mortality or serious injury between the two groups, either at five minutes after the jump or the 30 days follow-up. But crucially, Compared to the excluded individuals, randomized participants took part at a lower altitude and at a lower speed. This is a representative leap. <laughs> so, what can, we, what can we learn from this? First, typically, only a small fraction of selected patients are enrolled in trials. Second, enrolled patients often have significantly lower risk than those treated in clinical practice. And third, to learn 
to analyze the study with a critical eye. And when the data influences our daily practice, how not to dwell on superficial readings. We must be proficient in the study methodologies, in the statistical analysis and the critical analysis of the result. Conflict of interest is an ever-present problem whenever we talk about innovation. And they are not just economic concern. For doctor and healthcare providers, new technologies and industry links bring considerable research and experimental opportunity, which in turn can translate in career advancement and increase professional reputation. At the same time, a flourishing technological market also offers the opportunity to sponsor resident training and other initiatives for practicing doctors. This aspect is particularly important in countries where the access to continuous medical education is inadequately supported by hospital and the university. It is common practice to declare conflict of interest at the beginning of a presentation, but simply disclosure does not mean there is no risk of bias. Paradoxically, it can even be counterproductive. Those who declare a conflict of interest might feel they need to defend their position and be less balanced in their consideration. Nevertheless, disclosure remains an intermediate step toward the goal of clarity and transparency. What we need to improve is the manner in which we effectively manage our conflict of interest. Manages conflict of interest in a prospective way, avoid the restrictive practice which can undermine the relationship between industry and cardiac surgery. If indeed there are no conclusive data to show the patient can suffer damage from conflict of interest, or from studies sponsored by industry, or from greater incidents of misconduct, it is also true that we must at all costs avert a public perception of unorthodox practices in the medical industrial relationship. We must live in a house of glass. There is one last thing I want to point out. In the recent years, we have been investing, we have invested a lot in technological innovative products. Data shows that the market size for our most common te technological leap, the TAVI procedure, reaches $62 billion in 2017. It is expected to grow steadily. We live in an increasing globalized world which sits up in an open market. But if we exploit the economic advantages of a global market, we also come in contact with a global healthcare community that has more to ask than to offer. We can say with certainty that the fruits of medical progress accumulated over millennia are now distributed unequally. Of the 313 million surgery performed worldwide each year, only 6% occur in the poorest country, where over a third of the world population lives. In the last years, I have had the good fortune of being involved in a commendable initiative of the Cape Town Declaration, which has clearly demonstrated the need for improved access to cardiac surgery in countries where rheumatism is endemic. Today, we have talked about the innovation, define it as having impactful change. But in this case, simply show that it is the use of ex existing standard of care procedure that would have a profound impact. And since it immediately improves the condition of millions of people, it certainly can be defined as progress. We are Europe. It is our duty to call out inequality in health system and eradicate injustice. Across the globe, there is no an example of universality, access to care, equity and solidarity better than Europe. In our house of glass, it is necessary that each of us, at least for a few moments, turn the attention to a part of the world that could gain significant advantages from simple yet codified the gesture. Thank you all.
Thank you. I thought I was speaking loudly. Uh, I want, I li there are lots of people that want to congratulate you, but I think I would like to break with permission with protocol, and I'd like to have Stefania, Anton, and Katerina to come and congratulate you and take a pic family picture, please. We need a glass.